not just go straight for the for the catheter angiography? Well, why isn't that the gold standard? Well, I think in many ways the angiography is considered the gold standard, but because we can get three-dimensional information with the MRI and because we can also get the, the full flow information for all the vessels, um, I think there will be times that the MR provides important pre-treatment information for the interventional radiologist. And I think from the patient's point of view that it may be restenosis occurs, it may be that symptoms get worse afterwards even if they have got better for a short period of time, and it's extremely important to have a control study or a background for the individual so they know what they looked like before they were treated. And that way, if they're getting better afterwards, we'll see perhaps no new lesions develop, maybe we'll see the, the iron either stay the same or go away, maybe we'll see lesions stay the same or go away, You'll be able to monitor that the flow is normal after the treatment, and you can't do that if you don't have the imaging done ahead of time. So I think it's extremely important for patients to insist on getting their MRI scans done before they are treated. So how about we start by comparing what the full Hickey protocol is to just your standard MRV that could be done at any, uh, any scanning facility? Sure. Um, the reason for doing magnetic resonance imaging in the first place is, of course, to get conventional um, scan information such as three-dimensional anatomical information, being able to see or visualize the lesions that MS patients have, and this can be done for, by normal MR, but we also include that as part of the CCSVI conventional imaging protocol. To that, we add the ability to image the vessels. That includes both the arteries and the veins. And this can be done using a technique called 2D time of flight, which does not require a contrast agent, but is not as good and does not pick up the vessels in the same detail as doing a contrast enhanced time resolve scan. And with that technique, we can take an image roughly once every 10 seconds, and we can catch uh, the arterial phase, so we see just the arteries. Then we catch the next uh, phase that has both arteries and veins, and then over time, as the contrast agent washes out, we tend to see the arteries and the signal from the arteries and veins go away. But sometimes, if there are abnormalities present or the blood can't escape properly, you'll see that some of this contrast agent doesn't escape and it stays bright and acts as another marker for problems. Now, this data is acquired in three dimensions, so it's possible to look at this data from any angle or to create 3D rotating movies of this data so that you can look for stenosis in the upper part of the jugulars or the lower part or in any other vessels such as the external jugulars. You can also look for collaterals that are present and often collaterals are on the same side where we find stenoses. So having all of this three-dimensional data is, is very important um, for the patient and I believe also serves as a treatment planning process by which the interventionalist can use this data in trying to understand what they're going to see even before they get in there. we tend to cut through several planes in the neck, so down here fairly low, sometimes in the middle, and then up higher. And by looking at that cross-sectional information, we can get the velocities at each pixel or each point inside the vessel that we're looking at. And a we, traditional MRV does not do the flow, does it? And a traditional MRV does not do flow. So this is a separate scan, the flow scan. And so this, in addition to the MRV, which you described, which can be done in a standard way, uh, the flow is an entirely uh, additional uh, piece of the Hickey protocol. The flow represents a completely new piece of information. The, the MRV gives you the anatomical or morphological information. The flow gives you the functional information. So you can actually measure the flow um, on the order of once every 50 milliseconds. So you can get 20 points throughout the cardiac cycle if the heart were to beat once a second. And this provides a tremendous amount of information. It shows the flow throughout the entire cross-section of the vein, but in this particular study that we do, we can get the flow in every vessel, every point in that cross-section. So we can look at the cardiovascular input into the brain, and we can follow all the flow that goes back out towards the heart. And so this provides much more information than you can get with the ultrasound, which usually just has the operator look at the, the major veins themselves. Also includes 
other components, so say a word about SWI. Um, we also do an SWI scan, and that can run from the top of the head all the way down to the neck. Uh, we use the SWI scan to look at the small vessels, or the small veins in the brain, and uh, there have been some studies that show that people with more progressive MS tend to visualize these veins uh, with more difficulty than people who have relapsing remitting, for example. So we can visualize those veins very nicely with the SWI images, but we can also use the SWI data as a means to measure the amount of iron in different parts of the brain. So we can look at the basal ganglia, we can look at the thalamus, and uh, we can see if there are any major changes in iron compared to normal age-matched people. And we can also look for iron in the MS lesions themselves, and sometimes that can manifest itself in different ways. When I propose that we uh, get follow-up Hagee uh, protocol, full Hagee protocol, so that means gadolinium, at 6 and 12 months, uh, I, I was expecting the patients themselves to say, gee, that seems overkill. That's not what I'm picking up at all. All these patients who, who want to have, uh, have CCSVI treated, they all want to know whether it's working. They, they want to know whether they're having any more lesions. They're certainly hoping they're not. So far, as far as we know, people are not having new lesions uh, after they've had uh, uh, venoplasty. But they also want to know whether their uh, veins are staying open. And so right now, I make that decision entirely clinically. If the patient says that certain symptoms got better, their fatigue, their brain fog, their coldness of extremity immediately got better after the venoplasty or, or over the next week it got better, and if then a month later they say those same symptoms uh, came back, that suggests to me that they're restenosing. But I'd be, I'd be much better off if I had a, a flow quantification before they had venoplasty after they have venoplasty, now I can do it again if I'm concerned they're restenosing and I'll have objective data, not just uh, my clinical impression. So that's why I'm excited also about adding, uh, adding the perfusion. Can you say some more about uh, how that works? What's the, how does the perfusion work? What's, what's it telling us about the brain? Well, it would be nice to be able to measure the perfusion to the brain. Perfusion basically refers to the amount of blood coming to the brain which carries oxygen and of course the brain tissue needs oxygen so we measure this you know in terms of how much flow arrives at the brain per unit time and often per unit mass we don't know yet if the MS people have um, severely reduced perfusion but there are some papers that suggest that's true so using some perfusion techniques in MR and there are two different types of perfusion one with contrast and one without we could actually monitor the perfusion before treatment and the perfusion after treatment to see if there was any local changes in blood flow in the brain after treating a stenosis. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I look at it as sort of what I call the Zamboni theory, which is that uh, the jugular abnormalities uh, cause back pressure on the, on the endothelium of the venules. It sort of traumatizes them, weakens the endothelium causing red cells and, and iron to break through, weakened endothelium, which leads to the inflammatory lesion. Whereas I have a, a different model which says that poor, uh, the jugular malformations cause poor drainage, which leads to stagnation um, around the oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes then are weakened, they, uh, uh, their myelin falls apart, and the white cells are coming in to clean up, uh, to scavenge uh, the myelin. So uh, would, would perfusion uh, be different with either one of those two models, uh, with a banging on the endothelial model versus uh, stagnation in the in the CNS parenchyma. Would you uh, predict a different uh, perfusion pattern? Well, actually, they could be related to each other. So, if there is some back pressure, if, if the venous flow can't find its way out through the normal pathways, uh, and we have, you know, in some cases, seen reduced flow out the straight sinus, for example. In that case, the, the venous blood will find its way out through the other plexuses in the brain and in the spine. And that is an awkward pathway, it's a more inefficient pathway. And so that could be leading to a, a reduced um, outflow in that part of the brain and therefore a reduced inflow because of that. So that would then end up having both components in it. Yeah. It would have potentially this reflux effect or this increased pressure on the venous wall uh, it's believed by some people that that venule wall, the tiny 
veins before they become larger, they're the most susceptible to that damage. And at the same time, you may have a perfusion effect going on. And if you have reduced perfusion to tissue for too long, that tissue becomes ischemic. It doesn't have enough oxygen associated with it. And if it's ischemic for too long, then it may die. So then you would get necrotic tissue or, or scarring or something like this. So I think these, the, the role of these two may be interlinked together. The term I have seen, especially thinking about oligodendrocytes, is oxidative uh, stress. Is that the same? To me, ischemia as a neurologist, I think of ischemia as an acute event. An embolus goes up into an artery and causes acute ischemia, uh, whereas I don't think of chronic ischemia. It's sort of a truism in neurology that you never get a stroke from fainting, right? So obviously blood is leaving your head to the point where you're going unconscious, but you never get a stroke from that. So it's sort of the lore in neurology that ischemic is a localized arterial sudden blockage, whereas we're describing a whole new pathology that's never really been talked about before, except for varicose veins. We've never really discussed the idea that, uh, that venous insufficiency would cause not acute uh, clinical abnormalities, but these subtler ones that take much longer to happen. So that, that's very appealing to me as a model for MS, as you know, uh, when, I, when, uh, when Devin was diagnosed, I went back and looked at the literature and I thought, geez, the viral theory and the autoimmune theory, they have not been validated. And then I looked at the drugs that Devin was being put on and I thought, geez, they're marginally effective. Uh, uh, the British medical group uh, threatened to stop paying for them. They thought they were so ineffective. So then when I heard about this model, it made great sense to me. It's still a little bit of a mystery why my neurological colleagues don't think it makes sense. To me, it makes very good sense that uh, that you need your brain parenchyma to be cleansed, to be to be flowing uh, properly. And uh, but yes, of course, the pathology is not. We don't really care what the jugular veins look like. We care what's going on in the venules uh, and the brain parenchyma uh, up in the head. Um, so I think my fMRI model is trying to look at that with the venous undershoot. But I'm particularly excited about this uh, perfusion idea because then we'd be able to see directly the result uh, in the brain of these uh, abnormalities we're seeing perfectly in the neck. David, I, I think it's important that if people do these double-blinded studies that they're going to tell the patients that some of them will get a sham treatment and some of them will get the treatment. But the idea behind this is that three months later, if something serious is found to be wrong with those who got the sham treatment, that they will in fact be brought back and treated. So I think that's reasonably long enough to determine if something real has happened for these people and something neurologically beneficial has happened for them. And yet it's short enough that they know they don't have to wait a year or two years in order to be treated. I think it's also important um, for the neurological community who is pushing the double-blinded concept to realize that it would not have been easy to come up with a good design for a double-blinded study without having these observational data that we do today. So the fact that well over a thousand people have been imaged today means we have a better idea what to look for. And I wouldn't be surprised to find that we have maybe on the order of say 20 different types of CCSVI and you need 50 patients per type. You're going to need about a thousand patients to design this. And so you need to know what or how to subcategorize that type of CCSVI in order to properly design the double-blinded study in the first place. So I think we're much more prepared to be able to handle that. And I think the registry that you have um, got started here will give people an opportunity now to follow people pre and post treatment. And I think that the use of MRI is going to open the door to investigating the very important questions on how people are changing pre and post treatment uh, to investigating cerebral blood flow, for example, and to look at how flow is changing generally over time for these people. And also, most importantly for them, are the lesions staying constant or going away? Is the iron staying constant or going away? All of this can be monitored if you collect the MR data before and after treatment. <laughs>